call this meeting together for March 15th, 5 o'clock. We're going, we are going to have two council meetings tonight, so we're going to say the prayer at the second council meeting. We will say it, although. Any disclosure of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, we are going to go right into planning and presentation before us. Brian Whitehead, Carol Cheeseman, Anne, and I always forget your name. Really? Why would I forget that? And so, uh, pardon? Oh, he said Anne. Oh, yeah. He said it real quick while I knew. That's <laughs> Steve. So, uh, <coughs> we'd like to go ahead. Do we put Terry here right now? Sure. Yeah, near the chair. Uh, oh, I see. So, uh, Chairman Miller? Cole, I think it is. Okay. Members of right, Go ahead, uh, Brian. Staff? Um, I have a formal presentation, but it's more or less a guide. Uh, tonight's going to be more visual with mapping, and the maps were too big, large, to put on the screen in terms of the, like, the size of the drawings. So uh, we have hard copies that we'll be referring to, and Brianna will be helping me with, uh, I'll talk and she'll point uh, to the maps as required. So. Oop, wrong one. Nice one. <laughs> uh, for what we'd like to cover tonight is provide council with an update on what we've been doing since uh, the last time we met, which was October 19th of last year. And uh, really we're down to um, three areas of concern that we want to review with Council, all mapping related, uh, agricultural modifications, aggregate modifications, and uh, Cobden urban area modifications. So since our meeting at, uh, on October 19th, uh, at that time, uh, when I presented to Council, uh, the text of uh, the policies of OPA 11 are essentially agreed upon with municipal affairs with some minor technical modifications for labeling and, and uh, you know, uh, exception numbers that may have to be adjusted. Uh, but um, at the last minute, you may recall that we uh, had input from Ag and Food, uh, OMAFRA, and uh, they wanted uh, a lot of agricultural mapping included with OPA 11, and I'll get to that in a little while. Um, and also at that meeting, Council uh, wanted us to uh, determine if the um, Cobden urban area boundary uh, could be, like a comprehensive review could be considered to accommodate the expansion uh, on the BEI lands uh, as part of the county's official plan review. So uh, we actually had a meeting with uh, a conference call with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs on that on the uh, uh, 28th of, of October. And uh, the storyline that we got there was that under no circumstances can you undertake a comprehensive review until such time as the county official plan is updated in accordance with provincial policy uh, in order to uh, set growth allocations for each municipality. So uh, that's an issue that the county is dealing with the province on. And uh, uh, so what we concluded was because the county had already been through um, uh, the public consultation process and if we were to tr introduce a, a comprehensive review uh, as part of you know, that process that they'd have to go back to the public and that's probably something that they didn't want to do. But um, it, is, it would be possible to do a separate official plan amendment concurrently with the county's review that could look at a comprehensive review uh, as part of the county review. And that could take place concurrently with, with the uh, uh, expansion of the wastewater treatment plant. Is people clear on that? Probably a little confusing, eh? So, 
So a comprehensive review, you have to think of it like a pyramid. So there's um, the pro uh, provincial policy says that upper tier municipalities have to do all the uh, population and employment allocations, they're called, for all the lower tier municipalities. So Whitewater gets 12%, uh, Petawawa gets 29%, Deep River gets 1.5%, you know, and then that's how much they're allowed to grow. Or and uh, so once you get your allocation for growth over the planning period, then you do a plan that would determine how much of that growth would occur in urban areas, how much would occur in rural areas. So you would look at the whole municipality. You wouldn't just look at Cobden. You'd have to look at Beechburg as well and determine how much growth would occur in those communities uh, versus how much would occur in the rural and waterfront areas. So uh, and that's a process that would have to follow after the county's official plan is updated is basically what they're telling us and there was there was absolutely no flexibility on that and we've we've taken a run at them on this uh, probably three or maybe four times because uh, what we've tried to do is make just a, a minor adjustment and I'm getting a little ahead of myself and but in our last conversation we said well can we at least include the wastewater treatment plant in the Cobden urban area and they said no Imagine that. So, and if I could just add, <clears throat> we've fought the good fight on this one, and uh, and I think the OPA has as approved was generous in terms of trying to kind of clean up that line, um, and we've we've looked at it with our legal counsel as well. Um, what the other thing is that if we're looking at some commercial uses in and around those places, some of that and review with the county could be permitted in the existing designation, so it doesn't mean that no development can occur. Yeah. And there's a portion that is already in the urban area that could be developed on services, so it doesn't freeze out development forever, and um, it just means that we have a little bit of homework to do uh, in the next little while to have those lands added at a later date and look at is there p p potential for swapping lands even. There's some lands that are included in the old village boundary that probably will never get developed just because of rock and their use. So it just it doesn't mean that that issue is over. It just means that we weren't able to solve it with OPA 11. Correct. And we have some rec with this presentation, we'll deal with each of the three topic areas, agriculture, aggregates, and, and Cobden urban area. Uh, separately, and we'll have some recommendations for each one of those one of those issues. Uh, we had a second teleconference call with Municipal Affairs uh, on the 14th of November to figure out how the mapping modifications will work. Um, and what they told us was uh, that they expect the county or, or in the township to actually make the modifications that the province is requesting, and then send it to the province so that they they can approve it. So they're asking us to make mapping changes that we actually don't agree with <laughs> so that so that they can modify the plan in a way that we don't like to, to approve it. So uh, what's that? Well, we have to, there's no option. Basically, it's just somebody's got to do the, the mapping, the GIS mapping for the province. And we we will do it even though we don't support it, but um, we're we're going to do that. Doesn't mean we support it. We're just going to give them the, the maps so that they can write the modification of in the decision. And then Brian can talk about the step. If we don't like what they're doing, he'll explain the steps that we're proposing to take. So when we in an, in our conversation, when I explained to them that there were some mapping changes that we didn't agree with, basically. I, I, I concluded that there was additional information that would have to be analyzed or presented to justify our case. So that's where I uh, set out to prepare these maps. Here are the, the smaller maps, the air photographs, and we did a uh, sort of a more detailed analysis because the first set of maps on the yellow map and, and the red hatching that you're, you're seeing there, those are the areas uh, that the Ministry of OMAFRA, Ag and Food, are proposing to redesignate from rural to um, agriculture. So we're looking at about 12,000 acres of additional land that's currently rural going into agriculture. Most of these lands are in the uh, 
periphery. So we're, you're going, agriculture is going north. It's going toward the Ottawa River on the west and the east, and uh, on Codlin Lake to the west. So, um, and we'll go over some examples in more detail of, of where waterfront and uh, agriculture uh, uh, are affected a little later. So I prepared a, a, a submission and sent it to the province, and I looked at all the agricultural mod what modifications where they would affect the waterfront designation, as well as the aggregate uh, designations for the Lacroix Bay and uh, Olmsted Jeffries Lake area. So that was submitted in December. Uh, let's go back. I'm actually getting. I need to go back here. So between December 2nd and February, early February, uh, Municipal Affairs circulated our, our submission to OMAFRA and the Ministry of Natural Resources. And uh, uh, on February 24th, we had a, another teleconference call with Municipal Affairs uh, regarding our submission. And basically, they were following the lead from OMAFRA, and they were saying that uh, the, draw, the drawings that they they didn't accept any well, they didn't accept any of the proposed modifications that I presented, or very few of them, and uh, uh, essentially uh, we agreed to disagree on, on many topics, but it was apparent to me that the Ministry of Municipal Affairs hadn't read the submission, because they actually hadn't even read it, because I had in the submission included a special policy de designation for the west side of Muskrat Lake, and when they began talking about it, it was clear that they didn't understand it and they didn't read it. So um, they agreed at that meeting to have another teleconference call, which we had on uh, the 17th of March. And uh, actually, that was last, or the 8th, rather, a uh, week ago today, with uh, John O'Neill, who's the OMAFRA rep. And uh, we went through each one of the uh, agricultural maps. We, we were able to get some concessions from them, but, uh, but not as many as we'd hoped. And I can go through those with you a little later as well. So let's, maybe Brandy, you can go up. What I'd like to do is just briefly touch on the criteria that the ministry are using to, to designate these areas as, uh, um, agri as uh, agriculture. And um, what we've got here is, okay, I'll just go through this. The, basically what they're going through, if they see an area that's about 250 acres, uh, and it's from an air photo, and it looks like a farm, and it's class one to three. There's a seven class scale of, of soils for agriculture. One to three is considered to be prime agricultural land. Um, cl class four is pretty good land as well, but probably rolling. And then there's five, six, and seven. And seven is basically not 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 usable. Well, yeah. Well, Petawawa might even be a bit better than that, but it's rocks and sticks and stuff, right? But um, anything that's four to seven that's associated with uh, one to three gets drawn in. So if you, have, if you have an area that's 250 acres and there's a hill there or there's a pocket of poor soils or the lower capability soils, then it still gets designated aggregate. And they also, or agriculture. So they also take this designation right to the shoreline. It goes right to the shoreline of the Ottawa, right to the shoreline of Muscat Lake, right to the shorelines of, of uh, whatever property that they're dealing with, unless it's an existing waterfront lot. So um, just to highlight some of the examples, uh, we'll just start over here, Brianna, with, uh, well, actually, just go, let's start with area one. I'll just point, I, area um, on, uh, the Beachburg Road, and if, you, if you're driving, driving on the Beachburg Road, on the left-hand side, there's some dairy farms and big farms, and it's low and it floods in the spring. Well, that whole area is uh, currently rural, and they want it all designated agriculture. And it's actually pretty good farmland, but it floods in the spring. So, uh, so it's really not us usable for waterfront residential development because it's in the floodplain. So moving down there, there, there's actually two areas there. Um, Moving down to uh, area, yeah, that one. 
she's pointing to a small 12-acre parcel of land on the waterfront. It's actually owned by the Kenny family, <laughs> and uh, it's in association with some farmland on the other side of the road, the, quite a bit of which is actually designated aggregate at the moment. And uh, they wouldn't they wouldn't budge on that 12 acres. It, you're looking at a continuous and uninterrupted shoreline of dozens of kilometers of waterfront with one 10 acre spot and they won't budge. Moving on. Uh, that's a farm up at the top end. I don't know who owns it, but uh, um, there's a huge uh, hill separating it from a larger agricultural area to the south, but there's a farm there and they look on an air photo and uh, there's about a kilometer of shoreline there and they want the whole thing designated agri 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 agriculture all the way to the shoreline. M moving on. I don't know who the owner is. Yeah. And we'll go to one of the examples of the uh, La Paz area, and maybe just point from you know the shoreline that's affected on the on the map, right from La Paz all the way down to I guess where she's pointing there is the old, it's more or less the former town line between Westmeath and Ross, and uh, that whole shoreline uh, or that whole the La Paz Road and the Grant Settlement Road between the road and the and the river was rural, and we're proposing waterfront. And also, and during the process, um, it was Del O'Brien that came forward and wanted the land side, or the farm side, designated waterfront as well, so that people could sever lands off of uh, of that side of the road as well. And that was something he felt strongly about. So, uh, if you go to the example, Brianna, just point to that. So this is near the junction of uh, La Paz Road and uh, Grant Settlement Road. You can show the junction there, Brianna, right there. So the purple is the existing agriculture that we were putting, proposing to put into uh, waterfront. The, uh, the pink is uh, currently rural, and Omafra wants it all put into agriculture along the entire strip. And uh, the yellow areas are areas that we were proposing to, like they're gaps, that, but Omafra wants the designation to go right to the river. So it, it shows up more on some of the other ones, but I've only shown one out of a, a strip of about four or five maps along that shoreline that would be affected. Okay. Brian? Yep. Could you just repeat what you said about the purple there? I got confused there. Well, the purple is currently agricultural in the official plan now, in the county plan. It goes right up to the edge of uh, La Paz Road and, and Grant Settlement Road in this area. So what we were proposing to do is to put it in a waterfront designation to allow some development on that side of the pass road and the Grand Settlement Road. And you can have waterfront not on water? I'm confused. Is that well, not on water? It's not on waterfront, but from there water you... View. It's water, water view. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. You can see it You can see it from there, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Councillor Jackson? So even though there's all the development with all the cottages along um, the Ottawa River, they want that designated as agricultural. No, the, the cottages would be able to stay as waterfront. Anything that's existing. Right. But would the overall layer be agricultural? No, it would be anything that's existing waterfront would stay waterfront. Would stay waterfront. But any gaps in between, you know, like the yellow area so there? So if there was an undeveloped. The in-between lands that aren't developed would have to go to agriculture, even if they're clearly not uh, in agricultural use. And I think some of those properties have been severed off. Um, I don't know if it's down at the lake or not, but it is a, a Kenny, but not, they are related. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a different family. Um, it makes no sense to me what they're doing at right. all. Right. Um, the next area you can point to was the, uh, oh, no, no, that's aggregate, we'll get to that later. Um, that area right there, that's the uh, the brewery property. Uh, there's 200 acres there, uh, 100 acres for the brewery, and it was subject to an official plan amendment uh, years ago, and uh, it's got a site plan approval and, and zoning approval for tourist commercial. And uh, 
so the 100 acres beside it is uh, is rural at the moment with no site plan approvals. They agreed that the Bury property could be remain in waterfront, but the other property would have to be in agriculture. And uh, similarly, moving down to the wilderness tours area, I didn't, I don't have a map here, but um, I've got them here if anybody wants to see them. Uh, but the entire wilderness tours operation was designated agriculture, rafters, the whole thing. They just looked at a map and they photographed and included the whole thing. So uh, um, we were able to negotiate some adjustments, uh, basically to follow the lines of some severances that went through last year for agricultural purposes, and everything else is we argued was its own tourist commercial and and outside of those agricultural lots, and, and they agreed with that. But there's uh, some other areas uh, that we were proposing to put in waterfront south of there that they they want removed along along the river. Down there. <coughs> Sorry, Mayor. Go ahead. We're dealing with people don't even know what a tractor looks like. We're, we're, we're dealing with people that uh, make their decisions in the high rise in Toronto, and it, it, it's quite, uh, I, I'm quite embarrassed for them actually watching and listening to what you said. It's quite ridiculous. Yeah. Well, they, should, more. <coughs> they should come up and find out how much of uh, Wilderness Joe's property can be farmed. Well, John O'Neill, the O'Mafra, he's out of Campville. He claims he's been up. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> he's done a windshield survey. Is he sure? Is he is he sure it was up here that he was? But the problem we've got is that he's the expert for the province, and the provincial policy defines what what prime agricultural lands are. He's got the mapping, he's got air photographs, and he's got an opinion. To fight that opinion, you have to hire your own expert to challenge his information, and it's far beyond the level of expertise that, that Charles and I have. Uh, but we have a we we have, have a, a recommendation. Plan? We have a recommendation on that that we'll present to you later. So, so we don't have to go to that one now. Uh, Daryl. That's waterfront. So moving on to the Muskrat Lake uh, policies. So you can see again where um, they're taking the designation rate, rate to the, the, the shoreline of the lake and uh, the yellow represents ex areas of existing waterfront development that would remain in the waterfront designation but for the most part everything on the west side of the lake would be going to from to agriculture. Right now there's a, a rural designation along the entire shoreline. We ask for that to be the waterfront designation to apply to that area and uh, they said no. Um, so we also uh, uh, pr presented a policy uh, if, because this, this is the way I see the, the problem. Uh, from a provincial point of view you've got policies related to water quality and you got policies related to agriculture and they're both important but how do you balance the water quality of Muskrat Lake uh, against the importance of maintaining agriculture. Now this side of the lake you know everybody probably knows it's pretty there's some pretty good farms it's good farmland it's class 3 soils according to the information which is high capability soils for agriculture and there's some pretty big farms along there and the shoreline along that part of the lake isn't isn't the best. I mean it's sort of weedy and you know for about 100 meters you probably can't get a dock in and if it was nice shoreline it might be developed already um, but um, essentially the, the municipal affairs is not in my mind juggling the interests of, of the water quality of the lake versus the policies what we're trying to achieve so on the one hand Ministry of the Environment is working with this to come up with a muskrat lake policy framework on the other hand OMAFRA is saying no this is the letter of the law, it has to go right to the shoreline. Where's, where's the balance between the two? Well, there isn't in this case. So, 
If you can't fire them right up to the lake, they must have to put a buffer like. Uh, well, it would, then that's a good point because if there's a farm plan or, or a nutrient management plan, or, and this is what their argument is, if, then you would have a buffer, but in, in those plans, a three meter buffer is suitable. You need 50 feet or 25 feet in. But if, you, if it's in the waterfront designation and it's residential development, Ministry of the Environment will demand a 30 meter buffer. So um, this, these are the, the challenges. So when we try to say we want a waterfront and there, uh, we came up with what I, I referred to as a waterfront exception designation and uh, which would, um, uh, all the permitted uses would be in accordance with the agricultural designation only. So it would be really agricultural, but also overlaying the development control policies of the Muskrat Lake designation. So if somebody, if a farmer wanted to replace a septic system, then he would have to do it the same way as anybody else on the lake with the right soils. Or if they, you know, um, did some work or put up a barn or put up a structure, then they would have to have a plan and showing how their, you well, know, their that. buffer, their, like the buffering policies would all apply. They have to do that. You have to go through the nutrient management every time you put up a barn anyways now. And what they were saying is there's conflicting legislation there, like under agriculture. But essentially, what, the way I see it is there's very few development controls that a municipality has over agriculture other than a building permit. You issue the building permit, and that's basically it. So um, there isn't a lot of development control that you can apply to the edge of the lake on the west side if, it, if it's designated agriculture. Anything else you want to? So uh, in, before our pre before our meeting with Lamafra last week, we had a meeting with uh, Janet Bradley, and it was her suggestion that we we go for a, uh, a rural, keep it rural, but uh, have as a rural exception to include the waterfront policies. And we'll have we'll talk to a bit more about that in a, in a second, in terms of our recommendations. Question? Yeah, question. In in regard to changes to the municipal act coming down, has there been any work or forward thinking done on that and how that affects OP11 or the Renfrew County plan for that matter, especially in regard to uh, say Bill 68, which is in its second reading pertaining to climate change. And also Bill 36, building code, what we've all heard a little bit about in regard to uh, the, the building code and septic maintenance and $10,000 a day fines that could be put out for that. How does that affect OP11? Because on the surface, I look at this and I say, well, gee, everything we were talking about a year ago seems to be dissipating what was the, what I used to call a year ago, the carrots in OP11. Well, now the carrots are getting eaten. And we're still stuck with this and it's still changing, I think, to our detriment in a big way. And we know for a fact that Toronto's not even reading the material. How can we, as a council, support this. I, I need you to sell me on that because <clears throat> it does not make sense to me. Could you touch on that? Well, first of all, I'm not familiar with all that legislation that you're referring to, uh, but I'm expecting that it would be implemented separately from the Planning Act. I don't believe that, you know, sep requiring septic tanks to be pumped out every year um, is something that you would overlap with. It, it was something that would have to be done but it wouldn't be implemented through your zoning or, or site plan control or anything like that. It would be separate legislation that staff would have to implement. Um, in terms of uh, comfort level, um, this all seems like a pretty negative message, I guess, but we have, we have a solution that we're going to propose. And it, it's, it's, we're reaching a point now where we're going to be recommending that you stand up to the province on some of this stuff. That, that's where we're headed, and uh, you know there, there comes a point where the negotiations have reached their limit, and uh, we have to discuss you know whether or not the municipality should file an appeal and how that should be done. The other overriding concern that Charles and I have is that these modifications all came forward last fall, and they've never been to the public, so we start out as rural, uh, we, we go to public meetings as waterfront and then the province waves their magic wand and it's agriculture and people don't know about it. So what, what kind of fallout is there going to be from that? So uh, 
for that reason alone, uh, we're thinking uh, in terms of our modification, we have some some recommendations that we think council should consider. First of all, all these waterfront designations where, where that scenario applies, we think you should appeal. Appeal all those, every one of them, on, on that principle that people were not notified about it. Really, when I did this mapping, my understanding was that all these areas that they wanted into agriculture would go back to rural first, and then th th whether it's agriculture or not agriculture, that would be part of the county official plan review because you know it's all part of those red hatched areas. The province came back and said, no, no, no. We want a two-phase approach to dealing with agriculture and whitewater. The first pay phase would be to deal with those parts of the, uh, the overlap with agriculture on the waterfront as part of OPA 11, and the remainder of the agricultural designations, the other 10 or 11,000 acres, would be part of the county review. So um, and, and that's basically what we're, we're fighting against is that we don't think it should be part of OP 11 at all. It's at the last minute. There's been no public consultation. So, uh, and also we're, we're thinking that the west side of Muskrat Lake should have a, a policy designation uh, on the, the existing rural lands, and they're sort of shown with hatching on there now too. And Brianna can point to them, but. Um, have a have our designation that does protect the shoreline of the west side of the lake. We can call it rural, we call it waterfront, but all the provisions that, of that policy designation that are intended to protect water quality should be included on that side of the lake as well. Okay, thank you. Councillor Jackson, please. With regards to uh, the Ottawa River, or all waterfront modifications, yeah. um, I just want to make sure that we don't lose sight of that exception designation. So that was that also included along the Ottawa River, I understand? No. Some of them? No, Ottawa is just straight specific? waterfront. Just waterfront. Just waterfront. So yeah. the exception was just on Muskrat Lake? Correct. Was there, yeah, west of Muskrat. Was there any on Olmsted Devery Lake at all? No. So it was just Muskrat Lake? Correct. Okay. So there is another twist here, like, and, and a lot of the, we've had discussions with Janet Bradley today and Charles and I have discussed it extensively, is that how do we let people know like what's going on here? Because we're on a path where um, the province is all powerful, they can modify it. Um, and because their basis is, well, if we can't modify it from waterfront to rural because our people from OMAFRA are saying it's ag agricultural land, it has to go to agriculture in order to comp be consistent with provincial policy. Case closed. And, um, and we're, our counter argument is, well, no, uh, people need to know what's going on. So the solution that we've come up with is that we're thinking that the township should have a, a notification procedure. It's going to take a month or two for Charles to update the plans, and we're going to have to update them according to the modifications. So now, on the plus side, there still is a lot of waterfront development coming out of it. Like this is 90 to 95 percent of the waterfront designation along the Ottawa River is still intact. So there is a positive message here. So if there's an appeal, it would only apply to those site-specific, there's about 15 of them, site-specific areas that we've, we've talked about. We have had a few concessions. Now, you'd notify all the, the property owners affected by these modifications, provide them with a notice, and give them instructions that if they want to uh, receive a notice of decision from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs, that they can uh, submit a, a request directly to the minister and get and, and get a notice of decision. Uh, then there's when it, OPA 11 is approved by the province, there'd be a 20-day window for appeal. Then they can they can file an appeal uh, and then exercise their appeal rights. There is some question about whether or not those appeal rights are uh, what's the word I'm looking for uh, valid enshrined. enshrined. Uh, because the legislation says that unless you made an oral or a written submission during the planning approval process before it was adopted, it, you, you're not entitled to file an appeal. So, and that which it really adds to the complexity of this whole notification procedure because it's all happening after the fact by modification. And, and uh, so, but it is still possible that if there are people that, like, if there are people that do want to uh, 
appeal and they are willing to hire a specialist to defend their case, they could uh, either present it themselves as participants or work through the township uh, because the township would be an appellant. Now, if there are people that uh, have, like along Beechburg Road, for example, they're, they're happy with the agricultural designation, then fine. But it gives you time to find out who, who who's not opposed to it and who is, right? And it could help by going through this notification process to find out from your electorate just what kind of support you do have with this appeal. Because even once you file the appeal, there is a negotiate. Like you can work toward a settlement, and it, it will show the province that you're, you mean business on this. And uh, um, if you have support from you know, uh, uh, your ratepayers, then it can help you justify what you're trying to do. Uh, but if, if people are happy with agriculture, that's that's fine too. But you don't know because we've never consulted with them. So that's sort of the strategy we're, we're Okay, the, the other thing that Charles is mentioning is when, when the appeal gets filed, uh, we can include a list of all the property owners affected by these modifications and then a request that the board, uh, indicate to the board that these are, um, what's the term we want to use? Uh, interested participants. Uh, and, and, and then they, they could be getting, they could get a notice from the board about when the hearing dates are. They can have an opportunity to participate in the appeal process if they want to. So, so there would be some ways. There's some ways we're searching to try and you know let these people know what's going on. Could you guys <clears throat> shed some light on timelines here? I know uh, Charles kind of indicated to me that he was hopeful that the Ramford County plan would be in order by fall if everything went well, maybe, or whatever. How does this fit in with OP11 and timelines of what? If it were you deciding, Charles, what would be the order and the timeline of all this? Thank you for the question. Since we've chatted, we, we've decided or determined that there could be no NB appeal to the OP11, which could hold it up a little. Our, our ideal situation would be have OP11 in place and approved through the ministry, through the board, before the county OP got uh, uh, adopted by county council, so that we would have you folks sorted out before we adopted the county OP. This may it may take a little longer than on our on our end at the county level to wait for the OPA level to work its way through the process. The, the board the board uh, appeal could take six months, uh, could take longer. So um, I would suggest we would try to keep county plan waiting in the wings a little bit. We're working still on things. We just got the comments from the province, as you know, Vice Chair, a couple of weeks ago. So we won't be inactive on the file, but we may not recommend adopting it until OPA 11 is, as I said, approved by the, the province and any board uh, matters dealt with as well. well. One thing I could mention too, if there's an appeal to OPA 11, on those areas where there's no contest, where we all agree, that that part of the OPA can get approved and go through, and it's in place. It would only be the sections that are appealed that would be would have to wait till the end of the board uh, process. So it won't it won't totally hang up all of OPA 11 if we've got these uh, individual appeals. That's right. So all the good parts, of, like all the policy wording, would be approved. There's no no appeal there. Like all the cluster development policies and all the other waterfront policies and all the special policies that we've been working on there would come into effect. Uh, we, I was on a call, um, and I'm a pretty <coughs> patient person, I was on a call three weeks ago with these uh, gentlemen, and we basically, at the end of the call, I said there's, n there's no middle ground here, so what we're looking for is a decision, a decision from the province. So we basically said we needed to come back to council, but they didn't seem, like we're at a point where we can't convince them otherwise, so we've already put them on notice that we'd like them to kind of make a decision so we can move on to the next step. But I think Charles's point is a great one and also just to your earlier question, there's a lot of great things in terms of planning and growth here and economic development in the waterfront area and some policies for the lake, which I know everybody's concerned about, that, that are gains. And what would be appealed is just these site-specific areas where I would say some funny business after the fact is, is, is happening. So 
let's not lose sight of that um, because the waterfront designation, in my understanding, was brought forward to encourage some development and allow it to occur. So that's important to, to reiterate. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions on agriculture? Ag My farm is rural, and the lady next door has 15 acres in Little Lake. And she, I have to get the weed inspector to come out every year to get her to cut her field. So I thought if we, and I think she wants to build a house. If she built it far enough away from my barn, it'd be all right, but I don't want to be fighting over that. But I, I hope they put mine in agriculture. Is this on the Beechburg Road? Yeah, on the uh, government road between Beechburg and Forster's Falls. Okay. Did they change anything there? I'm going to look. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So there's two areas of aggregates that are of concern. Uh, Lacroix Bay. There's a designation of gravel resource uh, on the Lacroix Bay area. Maybe you can just point to it, Brianna, right up there. And what color is it? Orange. You see the orange area up there? We we designated that whole area as waterfront. So we, we covered up the aggregate because it's at the end of the road. I, I mean, there's, I don't think there'll ever be a gravel pit up there, <laughs> ever in 100,000 a, a years because it's the furthest location away from, from anywhere. <laughs> And uh, it also, it's a lot of it's in the floodplain, and a lot of it is sterilized by existing waterfront development. The, this designation actually designates most of the homes as aggregate along the shoreline. It's crazy. So we, if you just show the, uh, I did a constraint map exercise for that area. That would, uh, that's at the top there. Um, so the, what color is the aggregate? Point. So after I took out all the uh, separation distances from houses and roads and wetlands and stuff like that, we came up with these areas to designate. The, the area in La Paz that, that is designated there, if you went to get an aggregate license, it would be a chance one in a billion that you would get an aggregate license. How can they justify... Yeah, that that's just makes no sense to me at all. If you can't, yeah. because of the setbacks and, and, and the designation, uh, doesn't allow for that because of the existing buildings, how can they justify? Yeah. Like the guy just isn't coming up from Kempfel and the guy isn't well, coming up from Ags and, and nobody is making sense of this. Nobody is talking to anybody else. But But that's a question <coughs> that we have to ask them. Like if you can't have a gravel pit there, why do we need aggregate? Well, there is some middle. I think there's some middle ground on this one. Okay. So I'm, I'm thinking this one, and actually I'm more concerned about um, Olmsted Jeffries, that whole corridor, because uh, I did the constraint analysis on there, and and really, you know, the, I use there's more uh, insects. I've just shown two examples. Like a, you've got Logos land at the top. And then you've got um, Yonder Hill and uh, I forget the name of the other campground. But there's 200 campsites in each one of those campgrounds. There's zone commercial, uh, or tourist commercial. I mean, it's it's not going to be gravel. And the existing waterfront is not going to be gravel resource. And Logos Land shouldn't be gravel resource. So, uh, but they didn't accept our, our recommendations. So basically what I'm recommending is that these tourist commercial operations should not be designated aggregate and um, also existing residential shouldn't be designated aggregate. Uh, we can eliminate the constraints for the roads and the wetlands and stuff and take the designation right up to those features. I don't think that matters too much. Um, and then there were some vacant lots that we, we uh, wanted to pull out of aggregate so that they could be developed as well. Um, so the Ministry said there's a protocol that has to be followed to, to do this uh, because they're saying the constraint analysis that I did does not comply with the provincial policy statement, but they haven't provided us with the protocol. So, um, 
there's a bit of uh, tweaking that's required, but I'm optimistic that we can come up with a solution on that on that end. Wouldn't that uh, gravel area at the top of the yeah up at the top of the peninsula there, where the other one at the other end, up top, yeah over there, won't that be an environmental like once you dig a oh, pit there? On this map, you mean? No, no, I mean right there, but go back to Westmead. Yeah, right at the very top of the peninsula. Yeah. It, wouldn't that be an, yeah all through there? Wouldn't that be an environmental problem if you dug? Totally. It, it would just you know the river would go in there. You, you know what they said about the 30 meter wetland setback? Yeah. They said, well, we have situ there's situations where wetlands have been extracted. <laughs> you know. Okay. And I thought, are you serious? <laughs> but maybe in Toronto, where you know they they remove a wetland, but they have to build another one that's somewhere else that's bigger and better. Can you see that happening here? <laughs> Never. So that was the example they gave us. A whole river would go into that gravel pit, wouldn't it? <laughs> but like, like the mayor said, there's just no common sensor. So, so, and so that, that must make us all wonder why we're even going through this process. Well, the like only really, when you really think about it, here we are, we're trying to figure something out that's right. good for our township, and, and you're telling us that there's no common sense on the other end. So it, does it really matter what we decide as a council at this point? Well, does it? Absolutely. Absolutely, because we have to, we have to fight for our rights. The, the onus is on the applicant to, to defend their policy. That's the way our system is. The, and the province is the approval authority. And if it wasn't OPA 11, they would have found a way somehow. So if it wasn't through the county official plan review, or I, they feel that in the conversations I was involved with, they feel that this is their opportunity to look at, at um, ag and, and aggregate, which they feel is important to preserve. These our, our partners in this have done a fine job of articulating why this makes no sense. So that's why I, I think we feel comfortable recommending that we move on to the next step and, and fight and, and notify the affected landowners. And what you have is silos of, of agencies. Ag OMAFRA is a silo, and they look at the world only through their glasses. They don't look at through the MOE's glasses. They don't, that's why there's no one agency dealing with water quality. Right? Oh, MOE does, but they're constrained by the other agencies. So M and R, they don't they don't care about agriculture. In fact, M and R and MAFRA between aggregates and agriculture have some legendary battles. But uh, in southern Ontario, so it's all fragmented and municipal affairs is supposed to be the agency that sifts through and Charles and I are sort of thinking that it just they're passing that back to Charles and I to sort out for, uh, for them and uh, so anyway that's everything I have on aggregates unless there's any questions anything you want to add Charles? No. Is there anything to do with numbers like in southern Ontario they lose about 280 acres a day so they could say well we're saving so they would save this would be part of the Big picture. Look at there's only two, according to provincial policy, there's only two ways you can remove it, agricultural land. One is to do an assessment to, to confirm that it's not agricultural land, like they hire a agricultural specialist that goes out and does soil samples and analysis and everything and spend a lot of money. The other way is with an urban area expansion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the other way. If there's an urban area expansion, then you can take up agricultural land. So, so maybe you could get us the growth numbers that we could do that then, Brian. Yeah, so in southern Ontario, you're losing lots of agricultural land, but up here, you've got to preserve it. So. <laughs> yeah. so we touched on the urban, Cobden, this is the final item, is the Cobden urban area. And uh, we talked about comprehensive review and all that. Um, we have a plan that we presented to the province uh, last week and uh, it was to retain just a small por portion. Right now, it, is it a red line, Brianna? Right there? That red line would have gone down toward the tracks. Let's follow it straight down. No, no, the other way. Toward you. Yeah, that way. It would have gone in parallel to the existing, you know, uh, urban boundary. Uh, right now, the egg hall and uh, the arena are in urban designation. 
Um, so there would have been about 25 acres of the BEI land that we were j just a little bit. Like, let's be flexible. They could do a planning study like a, to justify this, and then the comprehensive review could be done later. Um, and then we also asked for the wastewater treatment plan to be added, and, and they said, no, nothing, not one square inch. So it could be included in the urban designation. So uh, we've, that's where we've come up with this other plan that, uh, that Rob, Robert mentioned. So we'll, we, we can get around that uh, another way. Okay. And uh, so what we're recommending is that um, might as well appeal the wastewater treatment plant. I mean, uh, like, why wouldn't you include that in the urban designation? And secondly, uh, any proposals on private lands should be considered separately from OPA 11. We, it's not a fight that I think you want to fight for some an individual person. Um, and uh, and then con the council can consider a, a comprehensive review as uh, concurrently uh, following the county's official plan of ultimately, if you want if you want to do a comprehensive review of your urban areas. That that'll have to be done once the county updates their plan, or it could be done concurrently. But given that we might have a solution to dealing with this particular problem, it might not uh, be as urgent to go through that exercise. Councillor Jackson. So just the uh, westerly side after the Cobden Ag Hall that was already included. Correct. Okay. It, it, it currently. So is. that. Okay, that's good to know. That whole. Yeah. can be developed without further complications. Yeah. Good. Okay. So, uh, some closing comments. Uh, timing for modifications and decision from province. Um, we're thinking it could be a couple of months to, uh, for Charles to get the modifications ready, tidy up the aggregate designation information, um, prepare the final plan and send it down to the province for approval. And concurrent with that timeline, that uh, subject to council's approval, um, there could be a process of notifying uh, the public of the, about the agricultural re modifications that are coming down the pipe, and let people know what their rights are uh, for that if we really want to uh, exercise them. Councillor Rieger, would we possibly entertain another public meeting that we for all of these individuals because? We've already had our public meetings, and now they've changed. So will we consider another public meeting for these individuals? What, what are we talking about? That we about? can at least explain what we've heard? We, uh, we chatted with the lawyer about that, and she said there's nothing in the Planning Act to provide that vehicle. And then we thought that a direct notification to these, these folks and uh, advise them of what's going on, and they could end up calling the office if they had some questions, and getting them into the uh, the on the list of MMA was a Ministry of Municipal Affairs was a better way of doing it um, and just and dealing with those folks directly through notification. So, so there'll have to be a, a very carefully worded notice provided to these people and, and possibly with some mapping information, Charles, to, to show just what's happening to their property so that they, so that nobody can say they weren't notified. So rather than a public meeting, we would do direct outreach to each of these? So all of the, is it 15-ish? 15 on agriculture yeah. alone, but then so we would directly outreach to them. Uh, I should say that Doug has been heavily involved in this file as well. I have since since I've joined the township. Um, so we what we would do, and so is the county. So we would we would speak to them individually rather than come or don't come to a public meeting. We're going to try to speak to them directly, which I think will be more effective. I would agree with that. I would just not want to see them getting a piece of mail, you know, just a, a notification with a letter. Like I would like to, I would hope we would at least speak to them individually. You know, I. Uh, so it, it won't just be a formal notice. It'll maybe an invitation to call us, and we could set up uh, individual meetings with them. Um, some of these landowners were in contact with because of ongoing issues on their properties, so Doug's well aware of them. So it wouldn't be just 
a simple piece of paper, would, we would try to provide as much background as we could, and as clear as possible with mapping, and then the offer to, to discuss it further. And if we get that done so, so, sooner than later, before even the file gets final approval by the ministry, and the appeal is filed, we're getting them as early as we can, which I think will be important. Thank you. So this process that, that we've outlined is intended to avoid having to retain the, the services of specialists like agricultural specialists or or even M Mr. Mikowski for Muskrat Lake because the arguments that we'll be presenting will be more uh, principle-oriented planning principles in terms of no, not proper notification and, uh, and uh, there's enough information that we have that we think that the evidence presented by the planners, Charles and myself, should be sufficient and, and try to minimize costs. We don't actually, I don't have a hard number for you to like digest in terms of how much it could cost. Um, there could be, um, like I said before, there could be a, a settlement on a lot of this. If, if we get responses back that some don't care or, or everybody's happy with what's going to agriculture, which I doubt, uh, maybe there's a solution, but my experience is, some, is that sometimes that you go through this a process, just because there's an appeal doesn't mean you don't stop negotiating. It, it just increases your negotiating uh, ability. I don't know. I don't know if the province want to spend the time and resources to go to a hearing on this stuff, or at least all of it. Yeah, exactly. If the, Charles just said, if they see that the township is serious, then they may want to meet with us. So we would we would be using existing resources. So our planning consultant on this file and our legal counsel that we use for a number of issues. So we wouldn't need a. It wouldn't require. Say fan, not that you're not fancy, fancy experts or consultants that would cost us way more. Uh, we feel that we have the experts to help us on the file and a legal counsel that's very well versed on the board and arguments that uh, may win there. So that was critical in terms of my involvement to ensure that if we're going to the board, do we have a chance of success. So we're not just doing this on principle. We feel that we can achieve something by doing that. Okay. Any questions? No. Uh, Robert would like to speak for a minute. Uh, just to kind of maybe draw this to some sort of um, conclusion in terms of, of next steps, I think um, Brian and Charles have outlined where we're at. So it's really a mapping issue. The, uh, the policy framework, the policies have been uh, generally agreed upon. Uh, as I said before, there's a lot to like here in terms of the waterfront designation and the potential for, for growth, uh, but we do need to fight the good fight on, on these mapping changes. So the recommendation that I would recommend to you, and that would come back to Council uh, at the next meeting, uh, and as we said, there's a, about two months of work to finalize the mapping before we get a final decision from the Ministry, but it would be that the Building and Planning Committee recommend Council of the Township of Whitewater Region, direct staff, and the planning consultant to pursue an appeal to the Ontario Municipal Board on OPA number 11, as discussed on March 15, 2017, with respect to mapping related issues with the Township to notify affected landowners. So I think that would give us sufficient direction on, on what's needed, so we would notify the affected landowners and then uh, go to the board on those mapping specific issues, so the wastewater treatment plant, new ag that wasn't ag before, and uh, aggregate where it doesn't make any sense. Okay, thanks Robert. Uh, okay, moved by Charlene Jans Jackson, seconded by Councillor McLaughlin. All those in favour? Thank you. It's carried. Thank you. Okay. Th uh, thank you, Charles and Brian. Brianne and Anne. Brianne and Anne. <laughs> Everybody. Okay. We're going to adjourn and reconvene in five for a regular council meeting. <laughs>